Welcome to Ask the Experts, and I want to introduce my wonderful coll uh, colleagues, but before that, I'm Linda Malkus. I'm the Deputy Director for Research here at the City of Hope uh, Comprehensive Cancer Center, and I have the very lovely Sophia uh, Wang. She is a professor of cancer etiology. Joseph Alvarez, who is a, an associate clinical professor here, and the very lovely <laughs> Susan Newhausen, who is a professor of cancer etiology as well. And we want to thank all the veterans, as well as those who are currently serving, um, and happy Veterans Day. Thank you for all you do. And we want to welcome our, uh, our listeners who are actually watching us live streaming. Actually, your dad, who's a veteran, is watching. That's right. He? Say hi, Dad. Hi, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So we're going to have a lot of fun tonight. Um, and, uh, you know, so we, um, we have questions. Um, we don't know if we're going to get into fights, whatever, but it should be lively, right? Okay, so, <clears throat> so one of these things, uh, questions is, what's a mutation? What's a gene mutation? A gene mutation is something that goes awry in a particular cell. So all of our cells have DNA in them, and when something in the DNA makes is abnormal, that's a mutation. And mutations are very rare. Mutations can occur, um, they can be inherited, or they can be somatic or acquired, meaning that the mutation occurs after someone is born. So all disease is caused by mutation? Well, as a geneticist, I actually believe that um, all diseases have some genetic component to it. But, you know, just because somebody gets a disease doesn't mean they have a, a rare mutation that's causing that disease. But at some point, there will be changes in the DNA. So are there certain genes that actually cause cancer? I mean, have we figured out all the genes yet that, that do this? Boy, those are two loaded questions. Here so, we go. I'm going um, for it. <laughs> so, so let's start with, uh, with what we don't know. So, so far as a result of the Human Genome Project, we know there's about 20,000 genes within a human being that give the entire instruction set for how to make and maintain a human being. Those genes make between about 17,000 and 21,000 different proteins. And how it all works together is still, I think, a work in progress to figure out. We know that there are certain genes that may increase your risk of developing a certain kind of cancer, but the presence or absence of a gene by itself doesn't necessarily translate into an absolute certainty that you'll develop cancer. I mean, in some rare circumstances, it may increase your likelihood to an extraordinary degree, but I don't know that our genes are necessarily an absolute determinant of what happens in life. Right, and I agree with that statement. So. Um just because you're carrying a mutation, say in like the BRCA1 gene, one what of the breast that? cancer genes. What is that? Oh, so um, about 20 years ago, actually this year, the uh, a breast cancer gene was found called BRCA1, and it actually, it probably only accounts for five to 10 percent of breast cancer, um, and it's very rare. But women who carry mutations in this gene have a 40 to 80 percent risk of developing cancer. But that comes back to what Dr. Alvernas was just saying, that just because you're carrying a bad mutation does not mean you develop the disease. So what, what's, so if you're carrying a bad mutation, how come some of those people who carry it actually wind up with disease and others don't? Do we know? Um, well, for one thing, so if you're carrying a mutation, that means you have one bad copy, but then in the say your breast tissue, you need to get a second, a second hit in that gene so that you knock the gene out completely. Um, and so it starts with that, but again, not everyone will get that second hit or there are things that modify that effect so that, again, we don't really know. I mean, we've studied some large families where you have, um, you know, four or five generations and there'll be a, you know, 90-year-old grandmother that never got cancer and her, you know, granddaughter got cancer at 40. And so you just, it's not completely known. And the environment is important as well. I mean, I think that for some of these mutations like the BRCA1 gene, um, this, is, this doesn't account for the majority of cancers. In fact, the majority of cancers are not caused by these 
specific mutations. They are caused by much more subtle differences. And even for some genetic diseases, what we would consider genetic diseases, such as phenylketonuria, which people acknowledge is in inherited and inborn, the, the, the disease manifestations don't occur unless they're in the right environment, in which case, in this case, it's exposure to phenylketonuria, phenyl, oops, <laughs> PK, phenylketonuria. <laughs> Phenylalanine, excuse me. Gee, a little so, nervous. <laughs> <laughs> no, so I think the environment plays a large part in cancer development and etiology. And while there are certainly examples where you know, uh, specific mutations are associated with breast cancer, ovarian cancer, colon cancer, I would say the vast majority of cancers are not, in fact, inherited. Well, and, and I guess I would add to this, I think the story is way more complicated than we appreciate. I think. You know, like Sophia said, I'm a hematologic malignancy person, so I take care of people with blood cancers, and 99 patients out of 100, I have no idea why they develop leukemia or lymphoma or myeloma, and I'll never know. And that doesn't really affect their treatment. So when you try to dissect down, you realize that there are genes, and then there's this whole avenue of whether or not a gene is expressed. For instance, I may own a Ferrari, but if I drive it like a Yugo, <laughs> right, I'm no threat to anybody on the road. Mm -hmm. So this is how genes are. They may be present, but they may not necessarily be activated in ways that we express. And beyond that, there's the impact of the environment. And honestly, it's, it's easier to invoke this bogeyman of genes than to take responsibility and stop smoking and modify our lifestyle in ways that we know reduce cancer risk. So sometimes I think this idea of genes ends up being a subterfuge for making the lifestyle changes that we should make. On the other hand, this is a really important avenue of investigation, but I think we have to give it its place and accept that there's a lot that we still don't understand about it. So actually, I'm glad you're going down this, this thread. Um, so I wanted to talk there, you know, there are certain populations that are higher risk for some cancers. Uh, so one of them is the African-American uh, community. The men are more likely to get prostate cancer. What is that about? What's going on there? Well, that's, that's, that's a very complex issue. <laughs> yeah, they don't, it's still not known. I mean, they think there might be some small genetic component. They think some of it is um, access to care, but it's really, it's not known, and I, I think African-American men may actually present with more aggressive disease as well. well. The same is also for breast cancer with African-American women. If they present, it's usually worst case scenario or, you know, it's a bad disease, right? Well, but I think the jury is still out on that particular topic. I think there are researchers who are actively funded who are looking for specific um, changes, genetic mutations that may potentially predispose African Americans to a more aggressive cancer. At the same time, however, it's widely known that many African American communities have poor access to care, and by the time they are diagnosed, there's a more advanced a stage of disease. So it's at this point in time, it's hard it's to clear. know. It's but not I, clear. But I think some of it for the African American women, they have what's called triple negative breast cancer, so estrogen and progesterone and uh, uh, her, her, her two, two new right. negative, and that actually is a more aggressive disease, and so they have a higher proportion than uh, others. Because when they've done studies looking at equal access to care, they, they just present with worse disease. Not all of them, of course. Um, yeah, go ahead, John. No, no, but I, I said, I, I think the nature of this discussion, though, is that we realize we, we, we want to look at one thing, genes, but it's in the discussion, you can't divorce it from economic issues or access to care, or the impact of racial disparities in healthcare access, or even the quality of care once people access healthcare. So I think, you know, one of the powerful tools of being a place like this is that you can look at an issue from both a very particular perspective, but also more broadly, you know, what are the social dimensions of this? What are the human dimensions of it? And to what extent do genes impact and when based upon all those characteristics? So going back to the environment, a question I have here is that Japanese Americans have higher rates of some cancers, colorectal, stomach, prostate, and breast cancer compared with other groups. What's going on there? Well, that goes back to what Joe just talked about. And so for breast cancer, for example, uh, some of the associations have been linked to acculturation as the Japanese American develop a more westernized diet. Other um, cancers are affiliated with or associated with the um, originals, 
original culture of the, of the diet that they have. So for example, um, preserved meats. Uh, those are associated with higher risk of certain cancers, such as colon cancer. So I think before we jump to, I'm, I'm not discounting the um, association with specific genes by specific racial or ethnic groups, but before we jump to that scenario, I think we have to take a close look at what the environment um, uh, leads to. And it seems like there's a, yeah, it all plays a role because if you do look at migration, as um, Sophia was saying, the r rates of cancer go up as people um, live in the U.S., probably due to environmental effects. But it's still, in the case of the Asian Americans, in general, they have lower risks of cancer than um, whites do. And actually, I think that, that um, about the Japanese Americans, it's in contrast to other Asian Americans. Although I think Asians in general do have higher rates of stomach cancer than say. Um, I think it's cancer specific. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You had once talked about actually um, about the, the it, talking about environment from the last time we spoke, and you actually did a study and you were talking about certain food. Um, I think it was for your PhD work that you did. Oh, aflatoxin. Right. Yes, actually, liver cancer. Can you tell me a little bit about that? That was. That was interesting, and it plays on the, the discussion right. of genes and environment here. Right, so um, my dissertation topic was on liver cancer, hepatocellular carcinoma, and it was conducted in China. And we were looking at risk factors for hepatocellular carcinoma. And in a particular region outside of Shanghai in the Qidong province, the risk factor is hepatitis B infection. So when people ask, is cancer infectious? I often, when they ask me that, I often say no. But some risk factors for cancer, in fact, are um, infectious, such as hepatitis B. And in that particular province, there was an interaction, meaning two independent risk factors, hepatitis B and in this case aflatoxin, which is a mole that's found in corn that's um, kept over the, win the long winter months. And mold forms, and when the um, individuals in this particular province eat it, they, have, they are ingesting um, mold that causes increased risk for liver cancer. And so I think in this particular um, uh, scenario, we see clear interaction, meaning that the risk factor that is imparted by hepatitis B is not only added to the risk factor imparted by the mold aflatoxin, but it actually compounds that risk to raise individuals' risk for hepatitis B carcinoma quite high. So one of these things about the environment, you know, people talk about microwaves, you know, but then viruses like and, and, and moles, they, they can play a role as well. Like and they can people. interact with genes as well. Right. So I think one of the uh, things that we as researchers are doing now are trying to uncover gene environment interactions. We haven't quite uncovered anything as astounding as hepatitis B virus and aflatoxin, but I think that's one thing that we're trying to mine with the um, Human Genome Project. So questions that sometimes I get, you know, I, I said the last time when I did one of these that I, I do a lot of flying, and when you fly and you tell people that, you know, you're a cancer researcher, you get really chummy with everybody in your, by your, your seats, you know? And I get so many questions, and a question that has come up sometimes is, um, you know, um, you know, my father had cancer, or, and does that mean I'm going to get cancer? How, you know, actually, Joe, you must d d deal with this. Deal with it, I mean, both medically and personally. My father did have cancer and died of colon cancer. And when we look at what do you do with that information, then there are things that we can do. So the right thing to do for me is to get screening with a colonoscopy and to figure out what that shows and to make appropriate changes and decisions in our healthcare at a time when it can really make a difference and keep a cancer from arising. So I, I think that there are things that we can do. I, I think there's a lot that we don't fully understand about this. But where, where I see this is that I'll, I'll, I take care of people diagnosed with leukemia, and one of the first questions they ask is, will my child get leukemia? And, and the answer is not as a result of anything that we're seeing here. It's a broad world, and as we know, the exposure to viruses and, and other things like ionizing radiation, there, there are things that can increase the risk of cancer. Um, and and I, I think what it gives you a sense of is that your genes aren't your destiny, but they play a role in the decisions that you make regarding cancer screening, diet, 
interventions that you do along the way so that you can take an active role in how you move forward in life rather than be the passive recipient of the hand that genetics happen to deal. So Susan, say that somebody's, uh, you kind of touched on this a little bit, say, you know, your grandmother had breast cancer, uh, your mother has breast cancer, what is that, what is that, what can you do about this? I mean, does that now impact me? You know, I mean, does it, if I have, is it in my line? You know, that's one of the questions, you know, is it in my, my line? So how do you, how do you sort through that? So a lot of that, you know, somebody, if you have a family history, you're clearly at increased risk. And so some of that would be, you know, what age was the grandmother when she was diagnosed? What age was your mother? Um, what other family history is there? And so, um, you know, if they were both diagnosed at a young age and there was, let's say, an aunt and, you know, a cousin and that kind of thing, they would, you know, have a strong enough family history that I think they would probably be recommended to have genetic counseling and genetic testing. So, but, they're not, but suppose they don't have that BRCA gene, what does that mean? And they still have that family Well, trait. actually now uh, there are these multi-gene panels that are actually more commonly used. So if somebody comes in with a family history of, actually they're, um, you know, for uh, pancreatic cancer, colorectal cancer, breast cancer, ovarian cancer, endometrial cancer, I'm forgetting a couple. There are these multi-gene panels now that are run although a lot of times they don't really know exactly what the result means because some of these genes are fairly new um, to there. I think in that case, if you're right, they come up negative, say for BRCA1 and 2, um, you know, it's sort of unknown and somebody would, of course, recommend that they get more frequent screening. Right, right. Well, and I think there's some important implications here. I mean, for all of you out there, I think the kind of conversations you have with your doctor and your healthcare provider need to be ratcheted up a level to reflect this sensibility. They can't just say, okay, cholesterol's okay, blood pressure's okay, see you in a year. The kind of conversations that you should expect, and I would say demand from your doctor is conversations like you heard about. Have your family members had cancer? When were they diagnosed? And then come up with a plan that makes sense based upon that, and what we know this year may not be the same thing that we know five years from now. So it's an evolving conversation. Want some of the emerging. Go ahead. Susan. Oh, I just wanted to say? to say also on that, you know, years ago I went for a, a mammogram and they said, well, you know, do you have any family history on your mother's side of breast cancer? And I said, no. I said, but you should also be asking about my father. Cause, Good, I'm you know, glad you, because that's something I wanted to bring up. Is it one side or the other? No, because, you know, it's, it's genetic. So you have, you know, 50-50 chance of getting something passed down from either Parent. And so it's the same thing, you know, prostate cancer, one would want to ask more than just up the father's yeah. line. So is there a, a tie between breast cancer and ovarian cancer? Yes. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> and what's that about? Um, I mean, some of it is BRCA1 and BRCA2, and there are several other genes. Um, you know, and they're both hormone-responsive cancers as well. Um, but I don't know how much we want to talk about BRCA1 and 2. I study it a lot. But um, women, you know, who are carrying a mutation in these genes, you know, it's recommended that they get prophylactic surgery. So um, have their breasts removed and their ovaries removed. And, you know, Angelina Jolie was a high-profile um, case last year. And the reason they recommend that is if a woman has her ovaries removed, she actually... Only if you're BRCA deficient. Okay, ladies? <laughs> Go ahead. Yeah, but it reduces her risk of breast cancer by 50%, and then the risk of uh, ovarian cancer or uterine cancer by 95%. And so it's, you know, that kind of thing. But again, you know, one doesn't do that just on a whim. I mean, you, you want to know that uh, there's a reason you should do it, that you're really preventing cancer. And, you know, there are other prophylactic things people can do, like more frequent screening. It, it, and not everybody has to uh, go to extreme measures, but that actually is a really good preventative uh, method. But there's several layers to this. I mean, she did that because she was tested for the BRCA genes. Um, but I think one thing to be Angelina, careful. Angelina, that is. Yeah. Go ahead. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Not Dr. Newhausen. Um, but I think the way we define family history has to be important. So I mean, you have to remember that the majority of cancers are sporadic, meaning they are not, in fact, inherited in the same way that you know, BRCA1 or you 2. You know what I call sporadic cancers? Dumb luck cancers. But go ahead. Yeah. 
Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So when someone comes in and they say, well, I have a you know, relative who has cancer, I mean, you know, the way that Dr. Newhausen described family history, that's exactly right. I mean, you ask, you know, are they the same cancers in a specific lineage? You know, how old were they? Were they young when they developed these cancers? But because, you know, many of these cancers can be common, just because you have an uncle and a cousin with colon cancer, doesn't, that does not necessarily constitute a serious family history. So I think the way we define and exactly who in your family has cancer, are they the same cancers? Are they rare cancers, in which case, you know, perhaps you know, more attention should be paid to that. But just like Dr. Alvarez was saying, having this, imparting this information to your healthcare provider, to your physician, is important. And they need to have that whole picture. Yeah, and, and I guess these days I spend a lot of my time on healthcare policy and what we should expect from the healthcare system. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is that if we think about what medicine should do, it's not only make sure that we're healthy today, but ensure that we stay healthy in the future. So the kinds of conversations that we have with our physicians or nurse practitioners are different. I mean, they're not just fix the problem that I have today. It's how do I make sure that for myself, those around me, my family to come, that we embed this concept of healthy living and frank discussions with our doctors in ways that we never have before. I think medicine's been typically problem solving, disease, treating, but none of us is a disease. So if our doctors are doing their job well, they're treating people. And that means restoring people to a sense of wholeness, ideally for a normal lifespan. And that's a different kind of, I think a much better kind of healthcare than what we often think about. Well, and I think, oh, yeah, go ahead. And Susan. I think that brings up the point too that, um, right, we're a whole being. And so, you know, if you exercise, you don't smoke, you eat healthy, I mean, you reduce your risk of all sorts of things. I mean, heart disease is actually the number one killer. People have more fear of cancer than heart disease, but it's really heart disease that's uh, more important. And so there are, you know, things you can do just for a healthier lifestyle that are gonna protect you against all sorts of disease. So my Twizzlers are out then. Well, once in a while, everything in moderation. <laughs> Twizzlers are fat free. Oh, oh there is a reason. So, Joe, I have a question you brought, because of the way you were talking. So. Between the time when you train to now, is genetics or the concept of genetics moving more into actually people? I mean, you know, it used to be when you were training, it was like you, you took blood pressure and all this stuff. How is genetics now impacting just your relationship with a patient? You know, it, it's interesting. You know, I read this article that was written by someone who had finished medical school about the time that, uh, that I did. And the article was titled, so much of what I was taught to be absolutely true is completely wrong. So I, I think looking back at when I trained, we had a relatively narrow view of what being a provider was, and it was usually fixing a problem and trying to do so in a compassionate way, but fixing a problem. And these days, now that we know more, younger physicians are being trained in a different way. They understand in a much more concrete sense, this idea of a genetic basis for disease, but also more broadly, how to translate all these things that could be abstract scientific curiosities into meaningful ways to engage people and their families in a lifelong discussion. And I, and I think that's been a good way in which medicine has evolved. Mm -hmm. Is there a genetic component to pancreatic cancer. I had an uncle die of pancreatic cancer, and that is such a, because they find so out so late. So I've been hearing more about that there's a genetic component to pancreatic cancer. Is that true? Yeah, there are several genes that increase risk, but I mean, nothing is... Concrete. No, no, I mean, BRCA2 increases risk of pancreatic cancer. Um, I'm spacing out, there are a couple other genes as well. Um, so can it run in a family? Yes. For pancreatic cancer? Yes. But, you know, then pancreatic cancer just occurs. I mean, as we were talking about, cancers just happen. Um, and then going back a little bit to what uh, Dr. Alvernus was saying, you know, part of what's also coming up now is this precision medicine, personalized medicine, which actually isn't anything that you inherit, but it's looking and saying, well, what's happened in the tumor that you developed? And can we target, you know, a, a mutation in that um, tumor that we can then help with. And so melanoma and the BRAF uh, inhibitors are a good example of, you know, looking in a tumor and saying, oh, this is uh, mutated. What can we do to fix that? 
So actually, this is, uh, it, this is good because I, I wanted to actually touch on emerging t trends. So say, you know, you're looking at three magicians here with crystal ball. And so what are we going to see in the next five to ten years with genetics? How's that going to, not just for cancer, but how's that going to impact just health in general? I'm looking at you, Joe. You start. <laughs> so so, so I, I, think, I think you see things on parallel tracks. So I think what Susan was talking about gives you an idea of some of the ways that we can take genetic information and ask better and better questions so that it eventually translates into more effective prevention, more specific cures and treatments, and I would say tailoring medicine to a person. When we look at lymphoma, it's more than one disease. It's more than 30 diseases. So when I started out in training, there were eight kinds of lymphoma. Now there's more than 30. Cancer, it's, right? it's a blood cancer. Right. And, and now that we realize that there's probably hundreds of different kinds of lymphoma, all of which may have a very unique genetic basis. So we're getting closer to that. On the other hand, you've got the 23andMe stuff. Oh, which thank is, you. I, I'm so, so glad you brought this up, actually. <laughs> so so, so you, you've got more rapid access to sequencing your genetic information and, and people are taking this without training or understanding or background and trying to make potentially dangerous extrapolations in science. I think it'd be very dangerous for someone to send in a kit, you know, rub a, something on their cheek, send in a kit and make the decision to have a prophylactic mastectomy. I think that would be the absolute wrong use of this information. So I, I think on one side you see unleashing a whole new kind of medicine. On the other side, you see the potential for people getting bad information, misinformation, and misdirection as a result of having these things available, but in an unfiltered, non-directed, non-useful way. And, th and that's kind of my fear, is unfettered information without context, without education, without background, is, is potentially dangerous. So I'm um, just along this line, because you, know, they, you can, for $1,000, I think, go and get your entire genome sequenced now. And they bring it to the doctor. What does the doctor do now, <laughs> currently? <laughs> when you come in and go, here's my entire DNA profile. What do they do? Uh, let me file that away. <laughs> let me file that <laughs> let away. Let me put that away. We may look at it later. Yeah, because really you don't know what that all means right now. Eventually, though, how will we figure out I mean, what that means? Well, so currently, the um, American College of Medical <laughs> Genetics, there are you know some mutations that are known to you know, cause various diseases. And so if somebody's, you know, so some of those are recognizable and reportable. So, you know, if the, you, you know, say for heart disease, if there's some special mutation that's been found and then you can say, okay, you know, this is actionable. This something can be done about. But, you know, 99.999%, we just don't know what it means at this point in time. And so I agree, it's going to be filed away and then, you know, slowly but surely we'll figure out what some of it does, but yeah. some of it we'll never figure out. Yeah, I think one of the skill in medicine is that you don't go to the doctor expecting to have every test known to humanity run, because otherwise they drain your blood, probably hurt you more than ever possibly benefit you, and that's like the worst kind of health care you can receive anywhere. Mm -hmm. This is the same thing. I mean, you could take genetic information and abuse it in all sorts of inappropriate ways and end up in a much worse place than before you started, and I think that's what we're seeking to do, is make sure that these things are useful and actionable and meaningful without instilling a profound sense of fear in people that's not justified. Mm -hmm. They've also done sequencing of healthy individuals, you know, perfectly healthy individuals. In fact, actually, um, there's a study at UCSD, you know, sequencing people over the age of 85 that are all perfectly healthy. You know, we're all carrying some bad mutations. It's we're just, born carrying bad mutations. Yeah, mutation. we're born carrying things, and it doesn't mean you ever develop disease. I mean, we can all live long, healthy lives. That's just how it is. We're all a little different. I, and many of these um, tests, such as for 23andMe, they're not even for mutations. I mean, some of the mutations that you know, like New Housen talked about, those are there are valid clinical tests for those mutations. But what 23andMe is evaluating are what we call polymorphisms, which are just variations in our DNA. They're not even mutations necessarily. So we, it's completely immature or premature <laughs> to know what to do with that type of information. Actually, here's a, this is a totally off, this is, I'm going off the reservation, guys, okay? But, so anyway, when they did this human genome thing the first time, you know, and I, I actually had gotten to meet James Watson of Watson and Crick, the guys who did that whole DNA thing. So, and, 
And, and James Watson at the time says, when we sequence the entire genome, it's all done. You, and I was a little student at the time. He says, you may as well get another job because it's all going to be done. <laughs> but okay. <laughs> he has a Nobel Prize, but okay. Um, but anyway, so they sequenced somebody. And it took a long time. It was like a billions and billions of dollars to do that. Who was that person? And did they have mutation? And because every, so I guess, are they trying to line everybody up against whoever that perfect person was? I mean, how did that happen? I think it was several people okay. rather than just one person. And it was two companies working in tandem trying to sequence the genome. And I think the, the question was, they weren't trying to, I guess the people doing this project weren't trying to answer every question at once because that's kind of preposterous. But what they were trying to figure out is what genes exist within a person, just potentially, not, not, not even defining beyond that because we've got 46 chromosomes, and there's probably a lot of information there. Just figuring out what potential information is there is an extraordinary achievement because it frames the next set of questions. And I think that's how I think about this stuff, is the more we learn, I think it may deliver some immediately useful information. On the other hand, it allows us to ask better and better questions so that we can, like Sophia was saying, be very specific about what we're asking so that we get something meaningful in return for that. And some of it is just learning because, you know, 15, 20 years ago, we thought we had 100,000 genes. Right, and, and right. Then, you know, now we think it's somewhere, what, 24,000? Oh. And we so have less that's genes from, than we thought. Right. But a lungfish has more, by the way. Did you know that? They have way more D DNA. Actually, they, so I heard a joke. I'm giving <laughs> you guys a joke, a genetic joke. That's just, <laughs> shows just how nerdy we are, okay? But, you know, they were talking about, you know, the smarter you are, the more, because E. coli have a little bit of DNA, viruses have even littler, and you know, going up the, the, the tree there, you have more and more DNA. But it turns out the lungfish has more DNA than anybody, so they must be really brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> but so, so some questions that you know, I, I have actually had asked to me was, you know, my child has, one of my children has leukemia. Can, some of my other children get leukemia? The answer is likely not, but there are some gene mutations which do increase the risk of leukemia. But I think part of it is taking the time to ask the questions that Sophia had mentioned earlier, which are who in the family's had cancer before, and really taking a thorough family history, because it's not just that one person has had this, it's patterns of people having that, even going back a more extended period of time. Um, there are some diseases for which it may be easier to say yes, no, maybe, and others for which it's more harder or more difficult. It's just, it's a work in progress for us. And I think we're, we're struggling at best how to focus in upon the person who's affected right now, but also reassure those around them that this is one of those sporadic, terrible things that happens in ways that we have yet to explain. So actually, leukemia in children is one of cancer's success stories, isn't it? It is. And, and, and I think maybe a different genetic question is, why is a disease like ALL curable in 90% of 5 to 10-year-olds and in somebody above the age of 60 curable maybe in 10% of people without using a bone marrow transplant? And I think that's one of those things that over time we're getting a better, better handle on. We realize that there are certain abnormal genes or gene mutations like the Philadelphia chromosome that almost never happen in kids that age and happen in up to a third of adults greater than the age of 60 that has an extraordinary impact upon prognosis. There are genes related to how we metabolize chemotherapy drugs that may vary between children who are far more curable and adults who aren't. And there may be even other series of genes that act in collaboration with each other that affect this. So we're finally learning enough to have a better sense of why that's the case. But it's been a hard fought battle to ask that. So, okay, so a qu another question is, I've had, I had cancer 10 years ago. I've been clean now of cancer. I must have like, no, I've already, I've already been hit once. It can't happen to me again. What do you think? happen again, unfortunately. Is your risk higher because you've had the cancer before? Well, in terms of, say, 
breast cancer. I'm not talking about you know inherited breast cancer. There's just a three percent increased risk every year of developing a second cancer. You know, and it's not really known why. It's just you know maybe you have some um, you know mutations in your tissue that are just uh, growing. One doesn't really know. Yeah, it's just not known. Um, but then again, you could never have any other cancer. True, true. Go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, you, you know, you've touched upon something that's an area that we're beginning to understand. I mean, there are now 14.5 million people in the United States who have survived cancer. And they're cancer-free. They're can Well, some of them are cancer-free. Some of them are not. That's a really so, so huge number of people. It's a large number of people, and I think how do we best care for them in a way that makes sense? And for some of these folks, the risk of another cancer down the road is higher, either as a result of some genetic issue and exposure, like smoking, or even as a result of the therapy that we've used to treat that first cancer. So I, I think the, the right answer is that we need to look at people who've survived cancer in very specific ways. And I think this idea of developing survivorship guidelines and caring for people in a way that's directed proportionate to their risk to makes saying, sense. Go off. Yeah, I, I, think, I think just sending people in a random way back to their community physician is a very bad way to hand off care. I think if someone survived cancer, then we are going to watch them more closely for issues related to either the development of new cancers or even delayed issues from the treatment that they received along the way. What so are I think some of the really delayed issues that could happen? I, I think for people who, for instance, have been treated for breast cancer and ovarian cancer, sometimes the loss of bone density is an important issue. Sometimes we know when people have been treated with certain chemotherapy drugs, their risk of developing blood or bone marrow changes can go on for years. Mm -hmm. So I, I think those are only some of the issues. So when we look at what should we look at, I think infection risk, uh. issues of fatigue. The number one complaint I get for people with cancer isn't pain, it's actually that they feel tired and they don't feel uh -oh. well. And, okay. I, and I don't know that we deal with those effectively across the board. Issues of sexuality after surviving cancer are important issues that we need to face. Issues of immunization, really broadly looking at people in a comprehensive way after they've survived a cancer diagnosis is extraordinarily important. So tell me a little bit about this immunization. Well, you know, after I'm a bone marrow transplanter, so I take care of a lot of people who've had transplants, and part of it is that their immune system isn't perfectly normal after all that. So for folks, typically a year after they've had their transplant, we start with the baby shots again. So they're all those things that they get immunized starting in childhood, we repeat because we want to make sure that they're adequately protected, especially in these days when people aren't getting their kids vaccinated. It's all the more important that we make sure that people are as adequately protected against all those viruses out there as possible. So that brings up a question, <laughs> a famous question. If you were immunized between somewhere in the late 50s and the, like the middle 60s, and you were vaccinated for polio. There's this mythology out there that, oh my gosh, you have a higher risk for cancer. Is that true? No. I think the what myth was is that about? <laughs> <laughs> the myth is embedded in this, um, the fact that SV40, uh, the simian virus 40, was found in some of the polio vaccines. And large numbers of studies have evaluated the association between SV40 and cancers. and they are null. There is no association between SV40 and cancer. And the in, in, initiation of cancer. Well, and I think about it one step further. So, so I survived those years. Yeah, so did uh, I. So I'm still here. <laughs> so, but, yes, but, I was very young. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, but aside from that, I mean, you think about how many people have suffered from polio and having taken care of people who've suffered from polio. I think the risk of not having been immunized and the severe disabilities that have come of people not getting immunized for polio during that time are extraordinary. And you don't want to underestimate the failures uh, and the suffering that those people have experienced. Mm -hmm. So you kind of mentioned, because you know, it kind of sounds doom and gloom, you know, a little bit, because it's like, well, okay, the, the, remember the fickle finger of Kate, fate? Remember that? And the old, what was the name of that show? Oh, whatever, somebody, laughing. Yeah, laughing. <laughs> <laughs> laughing, it's kind of like that's for the majority of us, right? They mm -hmm. get the dumb luck gene, right? So, but you've mentioned already things we can do. 
So, uh, so if you already have, you already know you have a genetic mutation, you're watched better, okay? And there are, and you have to be guided in that care. But for the rest of us, you know, who have seen, who are just, from the day you were born, you're carrying, what is it, what is it, what is it maybe this is mythology that I'm getting. I was told that everyone is born with eight defects in your genome. Is that true? I think it's higher than that. Oh, <laughs> go ahead, Susan. How, how much higher? I, I, I mean, it's not totally clear because, you know, we don't really know what all defects mean, so. But I mean, we're all, right, just, we're all so clear we're born with mutations. It just depends on whether we get that second hit mutation or the second hit, because this is a nice, lovely audience. Aren't they attractive, by the way? But <laughs> what is this hit thing? A car? What so is we this? have two cop So we have two copies of every gene, and so if you knock out one, and say that's like the brakes of your car, you know, you still have your second brake. But if you knock out the other one, then you no longer have that brake, and you know, you could say that disease would develop. Um, but then again, you know, we have these 24,000 genes, you know, and a lot of them, they're not necessarily redundant, but they, um, you know, operate in the same way, or there are multiple genes that are all in these same interconnected pathways. So, you know, you could probably knock out one and you have something else that compensates for it. And so that's why, you know, it isn't all doom and gloom. I mean, you know, most of us are healthy individuals and live long lives. And it depends on which gene is actually right. mutated. So the majority of the genes that are mutated were born with these defects or mutations. It doesn't really matter. You know, we have another copy. They're in genes that don't really matter. It's so good we're redundant and, you know, <laughs> we're just redundant beings, you know. Back up. Yeah, go ahead. But a lot of the, you know, the genes that do matter are things like tumor suppressor. There are very specific types of genes like tumor suppressor genes where if you do have two hits, it does matter. But, you know, the majority of the mutations that we have don't really lead to cancer. So I would say in some sense we are born with you know, mutations, but they're not necessarily going to lead to cancer. And, and I guess I would think about genes and cancer a little bit differently. I, I think our tendency is we think of a gene almost like an on and off switch. If it's there or it's absent, you either have a cancer or don't develop a cancer. And the way I tend to think of these things is imagine it's like a small town and you've got lots of people working in collaboration to keep the town running. But say something happens and the police officer or the police chief or the entire police force decides to leave the next day, that's gonna create certain issues. So there are some people or some genes that can move away without necessarily having a, that town end up badly. But there are other genes or a series of genes that may in fact, if they are not working well, critically affect the operation of that place. So, instead of thinking about one gene necessarily translating into one big bad thing, that's probably the minority model. Right. It's more likely that it's like a, a small town and if a certain number of critical people move out or become disabled, then the function and survival of that town becomes a problem. And that's how I think about genes and cancer. And that's really why, you know, cancer is a disease of aging. I mean, there, you know, your risk goes up as you age, and I think that's why you just, you know, as you age, your DNA doesn't repair as well, and you build up uh, is that true? mutations. Is that your DNA doesn't repair as well? Is that I don't true? know. You, what do you I think? know. That's my area of, I, it's a great study. I got to do it. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, I don't know. Is that, is that true? Is that a definite, that we know that? Or is there... You know, actually, there's no, I think it's just that you're generating more and more, you know, because we have a regular rate of generating mutations. And so, you know, it just becomes cumulative at some point. So I actually read a paper that suggests that exercise as you're aging increases your ability to repair DNA. I don't know if that's true or not, you know, that's tied into lifespan. Tell me about a little bit, of one of you, about telomerase and genes and cancer. <laughs> so at the end of every... What's a telomerase? So at the end of every chromosome, you have what's called telomerase. And so, well, actually, that's an enzyme. And so you have, you know, these... Telomeres. Telomeres. Yeah, telomeres. And so they shorten as you age. It's just natural. And so, you know, supposedly when they get so short, you pass away. I mean, you just, your body just can't... Uh, you know, generate new cells to replace ones that um, go away. And so, you know, there are certain diseases that are associated with uh, telomere shortening. I think there are a couple associated with telomere lengthening. 
Um, Tell me about rapamycin. Did you hear this lately? No. That, oh. So they're doing these studies on this thing called rapamycin. I don't know if it's true, but it works in mice. That they said we can all live to 120. <laughs> But they have to do it. They're going to do a big study on it. But rapamycin is supposed to work on, on these things. Okay, back to the stu back to here. So talking about environment. So we're all healthy, and you know we ate all the fruit and vegetables back there with a nice dip and everything. And suppose our parents were smokers. Suppose they drank a lot, you know, and didn't really live healthy lifestyle as we, we can think of it now. Would that increase my risk, you know, if my parent was a, a, a large drinker or, or a smoker? Would that increase my risk for having cancer? Not necessarily. I mean, I think that just as we were talking about the environmental aspects of cancer development, a lot of um, behavioral aspects are, in fact, inherited or they are transmitted from adults to, parent, um, to children. So. It, if your parents smoke and you smoke, yes, that could ah. increase your risk of cancer. Obesity is in some ways um, genetic. So if you yourself are have a higher body mass index, then that could increase your risk of cancer. But just because your parents have a higher BMI or have obesity does not necessarily mean that the child will develop cancer. I think there's a more indirect link. There is some suggestion, though, that secondhand smoke would increase yes. risk of lung cancer. But right, if your parents smoked and drank when pregnant, your mother with you, that doesn't increase your risk of cancer, as far as we know. It would be more with the environment once you uh, were born. Well, smoking used to be such a part. I don't know if you all traveled to the uh, former Soviet Union nations at all. Boy, do those people smoke. Uh, you, you can't walk anywhere, you know, without being so... Those, you would think, have higher rates of cancer, and they do see that there, yeah. Well, and I think this is one of those things that we're seeing in Asia and we're seeing in other places is that people are smoking more and companies are marketing to that. So cue forward 15, 20, 30 years from now, you're going to see more and more people diagnosed with cancer. And you know, for smoking, it's not just lung cancer, it's esophageal cancer, head and neck cancers, bladder cancers, and a slew of other cancers that you'll be seeing increasing in number over time. Mm -hmm. I mean, a lot of places, the cancer incidence is decreasing for certain cancers because of preventative behaviors. I think, unfortunately, in other places, because of changes in lifestyle, increasing caloric intake, smoking, drinking, lots of things, you're going to see cancer incidence spike. Mm -hmm. And that gets to the um, issue of what exactly causes cancer. And I remember, you know, as a student and wanting to study genetics, a lot of my mentors would say, well, you do realize that the increasing cancer incidence has nothing to do with genetics. When you look at the incidence rates or the increasing, you know, rise with over time, such as lung cancer, with smoking, uh, BMI, I think these are modifiable risk factors that we can change. The majority of cancers are actually caused by you know, tobacco, obesity, alcohol. So these are things that we can do today to prevent or reduce at least our risk for cancer. And that while it's important to understand the role that genes play, they themselves are not the driving um, force of the rising incidence of cancer. Well, and, and I would add to that, I mean, again, from a public health policy point of view, we have about 308 million people in the United States. If I could come up with a magic genetic screening test for people who may have a slightly increased risk of cancer versus decrease the number of people who smoked by 10% and ask which one has the greatest impact, it's going to be the smoking. Ah. By far. So genes are not our destiny. Genes are not our destiny. Wow. I think we're going to, we're going to, we should, we should, I don't know copyright that or something. <laughs> I actually feel very good about, about that because, you know, there's such a, um, you know, that like genes, that it's always our destiny, you know, it's always, you know, whatever has happened in the past is going to positively, but we can actually impact it back. That's what you're saying. I think in most cases, 90, right, to, 90, 90 <laughs> to 95 percent of the cases, yes, I think that's true. 
Excellent, excellent. So eating the right food. What's the right food? Not Twizzlers, obviously. But what's the right food for well, us? I think some Twizzlers is okay. Thank you. So I, I, I think it's a, I think it's a lot of it's a balance. I, yeah, I, I everything in moderation. Everything in moderation is not a bad strategy. So if you so so you were talking about um, lung cancer and smoking. So so based on that, then somebody who like chews tobacco. They get a higher incidence of probably things in the tongue and mouth and the throat. Then. Yes. So that's proven. That's that's a known. So we should nobody's chewing tobacco in here, right? And nobody's spitting either. Okay. So <laughs> But what isn't known is what the effects of electronic cigarettes are going to be. I mean, because you know, they're still putting chemicals in um what do you call them? The containers. Vaping. Yeah, and so we don't, you know, we don't know what the long-term effects of that what is going to be. What kind of chemicals are they putting in there? And so they are bathing, but they are bathing their mouth in with chemicals, you know. And so yeah, so we don't know what the great. We don't know what the long-term effect of that is. No, we don't. No. Okay, but there are good things. So what's good, healthy eating? I want to give these people a positive thing that we can move for forward to. What six or more servings of fruits and vegetables every day. Um, Oy. <laughs> <laughs> a diet that mixes grains probably has less meat than the usual slab of steak on the plate. So meat probably being used less sparingly, less saturated fats. Less probably red good meat. Idea. Yes. Less red meat. Less fewer cured meats. No moles or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think we have that issue in the United States. Okay. Yeah. And so what about blueberries and stuff? Are those good? Are they going to affect our genes? Well, that's true. There are these foods that are um, supposedly really good for you. Blueberries, pomegranates, um, mushrooms, what else? Y yeah, there are foods like super oxid antioxidants that are supposed to be good for you. I mean, they, um, and we don't know how much you'd have to eat. And a lot of alcohol. Now, actually, here, what, uh, what cancers are, are linked then to a, lo high, a lot of alcohol drinking? Well, I mean, I mean, the ones that stand out would be esophageal cancer, gastric cancer, liver cancer. You know, if people drink enough to develop cirrhosis, that's a big one. So there's a link between the cirrhosis and the... And, and liver cancer, yeah. People who develop cirrhosis are at greater risk for developing a liver cancer. But there's even increased risk with, uh, for breast cancer. I mean, it's not as large as liver cancer. But. And then one other thing is um, I wanted to talk about... Um, a little bit about inflammation. I know it's a, it's not tied totally to genetics, but there's such a dance now, or you know, that that things that promote high inflammation will promote cancer. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Well, I can talk about it from the perspective of viruses. So certain infectious agents are linked to cancer, such as Helicobacter pylori and stomach cancer or you know, liver cancer and hepatitis B. And while we don't know exactly what the causal mechanisms are for some of these viruses, one of the leading hypotheses is that it may not be the actual virus, but that it causes inflammation, that the infectious status re results in this chronic inflammatory state that increases risk for cancer. So would like HPV? or cervical cancer be kind of the same thing? Is that kind of, are they thinking the same way for that? Um, I think there is research in that area, but I don't know that that has been proven. Okay. But HPV is a cancer, um, is a virus, human papillomavirus is a virus that causes cervical cancer. And that, um, talking about things that we can do to reduce our risk, there is actually a vaccine for HPV for young girls that is effective for reducing, um, preventing cervical cancer. Well, and, and if you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics, they've actually broadened the indications for the HPV vaccine to not only young girls, but also boys. And we're seeing a spike in head and neck cancers that are derived from HPV and a lot of other cancers. So I, I think that, uh, I, I think we need to take this information and then translate it into action. And this is one of those things where you have a cancer that you know is caused by a virus and you have a vaccine that prevents it. So it, it really is a matter of making this regular practice that people are immunized against this virus. And then back to also inflammation. So chronic pancreatitis. Um, and what promotes that? Chronic prostatitis. Um, you know, both of those are believed to be uh, 
lead to increased risk for pancreatic cancer or for prostate cancer, for the prostatitis. And so that would be the whole what thing, promotes, the inflammation. What promotes those itises? I don't know. Do you know? Well, pancreatitis, alcohol can. Most okay. definitely people, when they drink heavily, can develop pancreatitis. And when you do it over and over and over again, you repetitively damage the pancreas. So that'll do it. Uh, people who have repetitive gallstones can also get quite severe pancreatitis. So. There, and, and then some medications can actually cause pancreatitis. So I've been told that I'm supposed to sum it up. So I'm going to sum it up for you. This is what I heard. I heard that we are all carrying genes for cancer, right? That, however, genes are not our destiny, and that there are things that, even if you do have one of these really bad genes, okay, that knowing that may not be a bad thing because you can work with your doctor to lower your risk technically, even though you're at higher risk, but to manage your risk. Okay, that's probably the word we want to use. But the best thing we can do, life and balance, eat, sleep, try not to abuse ourselves too much and we'll be okay. Is that kind of like summing up? I think so. Great. So I want to thank you all. You were a fantastic audience. You all kept your eyes open. Fantastic. <laughs> and I want to thank everyone who's watching us on the live stream. Um, thank you for uh, listening to Ask the Experts. Thank you. <laughs>